So hello everyone, um, both on site and online. Welcome to our workshop titled Lights, Camera, Deception, Sites of Generative AI. My name is Connie and I'm a 22 year old biomedical engineering student and also a United Nations International uh, Telecommunication Union Generation Connect Youth Envoy with a passion for internet governance. So in the next 90 minutes, we will delve into the multifaceted landscape of generative AI and explore its implications, both positive and negative, on our society, economy, and cybersecurity. We have three key policy questions that will guide our discussion today. So how can international collaboration promote ethical guidelines and generative AI technologies to harness their potential for positive applications in various fields? How could the prevention, detection, verification, and modification of generative AI content be improved through innovative interdisciplinary approaches and research? And what are the opportunities or impacts of generative AI use and commercialization on the economy, society, and cybersecurity, including accessibility, affordability, and intellectual property? And what policies and regulations could promote data sovereignty and responsible data use? As we all know, generative AI has ushered in a new era of possibilities from enhancing productivity in agriculture to modeling climate change scenarios. However, it also brings in um, a lot of uh, concerns about disinformation, privacy, and potential for misuse. Our panelists will be addressing these issues and more, seeking to separate fact from fiction, and we hope to shed some light on the complex landscape of generative AI. We will explore the benefits of AI development, ethical dilemmas related to its use and commercialization, and the challenges of cross-border regulation and enforcement. If you would like to ask a question towards the panel, we will have a Q&A session at the end for on-site participants. And online participants may use the Zoom chat to type and send in your questions. And my online moderator, Nelly, will be helping me with them. So without further ado, to kick off our discussion, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists who will share their insights on these pressing matters. First off is Mr. Pali Liberhan, the Director of Regional Safety Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Meta. She has extensive legal and regulatory expertise, previously serving as Director and Associate General Counsel at Meta. And her background includes work with the Indian Antitrust Agency, Intellectual Property Law of Practice, and a Master's Degree in Law from Columbia Law School. Next is Mr. Hiroki Habuka, a research professor at Kyoto University who specializes in innovation governance in a digitized society, encompassing AI, data, digital platform governance. His expertise and contributions have been recognized globally, and he was honored by the World Economic Forum as one of the world's 50 most influential people, revolutionizing government. Then we have Ms. Olga Kirikliuk. Uh, with a PhD in international law and a decade of experience in digital rights and internet governance. She currently holds the role of technical advisor on internet governance and digital rights at Internews Greater Internet Freedom Project. And she also serves as the chair of South U Eastern European Dialogue on Internet Governance, highlighting her substantial expertise in this domain. And Mr. Bernard Mugendi is a data economy advisor at GIC with a focus on startups and global development. His current role involves providing expert advice on data economy development in East Africa, designing innovative solutions, and fostering partnerships with public, academic, and private sector stakeholders in data governance. And lastly, but definitely not least, we have Ms. Valerie Yeager, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and an expert in internet governance and tech policy. Currently an associate at Bowman's Law Firm, she has also served as a youth ambassador at the United Nations Internet Governance Forum and has held fellowships with Internet Society, ICANN, and more. So now let's begin session one of today's workshop on harnessing the potential of generative AI for positive impact. And I would like Mr. Hiroki to take the floor first. So as someone with extensive experience in digital governance and policy, what do you think are the benefits of generative AI? And from your perspective, how can international collaboration among governments, organizations, academia, and industry promote the ethical development and responsible application of generative AI technologies across various sectors while advancing research and detection methods to address evolving challenges in the AI content? Thank you, Thank you Connie. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the session. Even after lunch, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and our mission is not to make you sleep. 
So uh, let me uh, start talking about the brief history of AI governance. So AI started to be used in the society uh, in the, during the 2010s, uh, maybe especially after 2015, uh, and along with the development and implementation of AI technologies, a lot of organizations started to talk about AI principles, which includes most uh, probably fairness, privacy, security, safety, transparency, accountability, etc. And uh, that trend lasted for like five or six years, um, uh, but now we have almost the harmonized uh, concept of AI principles, as I mentioned now. So there may be like six or seven pillars. And then uh, some countries started to talk about AI regulation, so how to uh, implement that principles into actual rules. So uh, in 2021, the European Commission uh, published the Draft AI Act, and we expect that it will be um, established by the end of this year. And al also uh, Canada has uh, also a discussion on new AI regulation on high impact AIs. Uh, Japan is not uh, the country uh, which try, uh, tries to you know, regulate uh, the general AI, but uh, Japan pursues more sector specific and, and more you know, soft law approaches, but it's soft law is uh, a part of the regulation. So um, anyway, so now we have uh, con more concrete discussion on to what extent we should regulate AI or not. And then 2022 or 2023, uh, generative AI came into the society and it surprised a lot of people. Um, and it has a lot of uh, uh, new opportunities that you know, and, and I think other speakers will talk about more about opportunities, but since I'm a, a lawyer, I will talk more about risks. Uh, so we have to think about what are the differences between the traditional AI and generative AI. So we don't need to start from scratch because we have already a lot of discussion on AI governance. Uh, and in my perspective, um, uh, the characteristics, uh, characteristics of risks are almost uh, similar between the traditional AI and generative AI, meaning that uh, fairness or privacy, transparency, accountability, all these principles are important for generative AI, but the difference is that since generative AI is more a you know, foundational model or more general purpose AI, so the risk scenarios are almost like countless. I mean, you can use ChatGPT for different purposes like writing speech or writing email, but also financial analysis or um, work teaching or, uh, or financial analysis. I mean, uh, a lot of, for a lot of purposes, you can use generative AI. So that means um, the developers or service providers of generative AI, uh, generative AI cannot uh, predict or expect all different risk scenarios, which means that our society has to accept or share the risks. So we cannot impose all risks to uh, the providers or develops, developers of generative AI, but as a citizen, we have to more consider more about how to live with this cutting edge technology. Um, and maybe one uh, possible approach is using more uh, technological solution. So since we cannot uh, predict the uh, purpose or use of AI, so maybe we can do some technological solutions to generative AI so that that AI will not make a, a, a bad bad contents. For example, you know, uh, a digital watermark, which is now discussed internationally, would be one of the solutions. Uh, or maybe uh, improving trans uh, traceability so that uh, we can trace who made this bad content uh, after some you know, bad accident happens. But again, here another concern will come up. I mean, if we improve trans uh, traceability or transparency, then there will be more risks on privacy or security. And you know, it's all these kind of you know, balancing problems. So, uh, and for example, the technical part we can collaborate or use t the same standards internationally. 
but uh, the more ethical part or societal part such as uh, like privacy risks, I mean, what is privacy? Well, what is fairness? This part should be more, you know, based on the democratic processes and it's really difficult to, uh, to implement democratic processes in, ter in international sphere. So that is a challenge we are facing and that is why the international conversation, and it's not only intergovernmental but also multi-stakeholder conversation is getting even more important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hiroki, for your insights. So now I want to move on to Mr. Bali. How is Meta actively contributing to international collaborations that promote the ethical development and responsible use of generative AI technologies for positive societal impact? And can you provide insights into specific initiatives or strategies Meta employs to enhance the prevention, detection, verification, and moderation of generation AI, generative AI contact? on its diverse ge user-generated platforms. Over to you. Thanks, Connie. Um, I'll try and address the, the potential first and then talk a little bit about, about the international cooperation. I think, you know, I've been with Meta for about 10 years and we've really seen the potential of AI. AI is really at the heart of what we do at Meta because it powers our apps and services. And uh, some of the things that we used AI for is, you know, for our news feed um, rankings, uh, for providing personalized ads, but more importantly for my field of work, which is safety policy, it's content moderation. And when I joined Meta, and this was almost a decade ago, uh, we had, we uh, have community standards, as I'm sure uh, some of you may be aware on Facebook and Instagram, on what is okay and not okay to share on the platform. So we don't allow bullying and harassment, for example, or hate speech or any kind of child exploitation on the platform. Uh, almost a decade ago, we used to rely very heavily on user reporting for us to remove that content. And we've invested heavily in AI and building technology uh, to make sure that now we're able to remove that content even before it is reported to us. And we, we publish these, um, you know, we publish these reports in our community standards enforcement reports and you'll see that almost 90% of the content that we're able to remove we're able to remove before anybody has even reported it to us. And we're now, um, as Nick Clegg talked about yesterday, I don't know how many of you were in the plenary session, but we've open sourced our large language uh, models, which is Llama 2. And we're also testing that in the field of content moderation because with AI we've been able to we've been able to remove so much bad content on the platform. We've also been able to decrease the prevalence of, of bad content. Another example that was you know that that was given yesterday um, by Nick Clegg is that we've able to reduce the prevalence of hate speech almost 60% in the last two years. Is really the to use the potential of uh, generative AI as we are testing it to see how we can keep uh, people safe on our platforms. And I think that's, the, that's, that's something that, that is really important to us and that's something that my team, my team works on. In terms, of, in terms of international cooperation, one of the, one of the principles that, that we've incorporated is from, uh, you know, from the OECD. The OECD has published principles on uh, on AI, as has the um, as has the European Commission, and we've incorporated these principles into our work on AI because we believe in in building AI responsibly. And I just like to cover four of those uh, principles. The first is really security and privacy and governance and accountability, and it's really important for us to build processes to make sure that the the products. Um, that are using generative AI are secure. And we have extensive privacy review that we use for all of our products and generative products are no different. So I know my co-panelists mentioned privacy and it's privacy by design. So we ensure that we adhere to the eight privacy commitments that we've made, including you know principles of minimum uh, data use, data retention, Etc. The second is, and I think that's something that's top of mind for everybody, is really transparency. We've, uh, uh, you know, we've open sourced Llama 2, and, and that's something that that we've talked about extensively. It's almost, I think, 30 million um, downloads to this day, and and even more. And we've published it with the responsible use guidelines to help developers 
also use safety and integrity processes in terms of how they're developing their own generative AI, um, their AI products. And so transparency is really, really important, and plus making sure that we're thinking about things like establishing provenance and having water, uh, watermarks in our products that are using generative AI. The, the third principle really is, um, is fairness. And I think that's been talked about it a lot, but it's really important to train uh, the, uh, you know, train the technology on diverse data sets, and that's very important to ensure fairness, fairness in the uh, in the process. And um, you know, these are these are the principles that that we've incorporated uh, incorporated to make sure that that we are adhering to a robustness when we're thinking about generative AI. And the last is really uh, safety and, um, and thinking about making sure that the generative products that we are launching, that we are incorporating uh, safety by design. And we do this by a couple of things. But, but three things that I want to talk about is one is red teaming, and and uh, you know I know that you know there've been there've been some discussions on red teaming, but really to test the products and have adversarial threats to make sure that we understand what the risks are and to build uh, build mitigations. For example, in August uh, this year, we we submitted our uh, a language um, large language model in a conference in Las Vegas where about, where about 2,500 hackers actually stress tested uh, the, the language model and we've used that, we've used those insights to incorporate it I in, into our learnings. And um, the second is fine tuning and fine tuning is really important as well, fine tuning a particular, uh, a, a particular product to make sure that we're incorporating safety into the product. So I'll give you an example. If you ask, um, uh, you know, uh, one of the generative chat services, how do you bully John? And based on the, you know, based on whatever the data set is, the, the response hypothetically could be, well, you bully John by being mean or by XXX. Fine tuning lets you uh, fine tune the responses in such a way that when that question is asked, the response is, hey, that's not the right thing to do, and here are education, response, uh, education responses. Or in the field of, for example, if a question is related to suicide or eating, uh, eating disorders, fine tune it in a way that you're able to link to resources and education material. So these are some of the principles that we've incorporated, and we're thinking about uh, to make sure that, that you know, that, that the generative AI products that we are we are building or we are launching have these incorporated um, uh, in the design itself, and of course, you know we are supportive of of the Hiroshima process, and and we are very eager to see the draft. And I think that uh, it's really important to have uh, multilateral cooperation and multilateral principles and guidance in terms of how we should be thinking about this, but. But and I think as was very clear yesterday, the potential is really unlimited, and it's really up to us as stakeholders in the process to make sure that that you know we harness the potential, whether it's healthcare or medical or just in terms of normal everyday use, um, in 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 the best way possible. Thank you, Mr. Pali, for giving us insights into all the different principles that Meta is working on. And moving on to Mr. Bernard, how can startups and global development actors effectively leverage generative AI to address global challenges, including sustainable development goals like poverty alleviation? And also what strategies and partnerships can be employed to maximize the positive impact of these technologies while considering local context, data privacy, and responsible AI use? Over to you. Thank you, Connie. I hope I'm audible now. Thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting to start at the very base of the question that you really highlighted in terms of how can you look at the local context. And I think one of the things that um, we should look at or we can look at rather is um, ensuring that there is um, uh, ensuring that there is remote access and affordability at least at the very local levels because in what we have realized or what I have realized over time is that there's a really huge focus or there's a huge sort of challenge between accessibility and now we're talking about not even affordability but accessibility in the very local areas where 
um, who, where um, various actors would really benefit from the positive or the positive impacts of generative AI. And we find that a lot of um, communities, a lot of areas are still, at least in the rural areas, are still struggling with the challenge of internet connectivity. They are still struggling with the challenge of affordability of hardware and, 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 and even software platforms, essentially. Because we know that over time that generative AI, I mean, for you to access um, for even to get access, you need some form of, you know, a smart device as an example. Um, this is still a huge challenge in a lot of the areas that at least that, that, that um, from, and I think it's also a global, um, um, a global challenge in other areas, not just in East Africa where I'm from, but I've also exchanged with a few colleagues from Asia and they tell me that it's the same, it's the same challenge. So at least one, promoting the accessibility and affordability in at least the rural, um, um, and at least in rural areas, I think that would really uh, be the starting point. And then from there on, you can then develop solutions or gener um, solutions that are really targeted or tailored to meet the needs um, uh, of those target communities. And why is that really important? Because it's important to have representation of, um, of, of the communities that you're building the solutions for. I remember um, uh, one of the ways that, one, I remember working on a product that was really providing um, advisory to farmers in one of, in, in well, now this was on a, on a use case in agriculture, and you're trying to develop a use case or a chatbot that would really provide some sort of um, um, information in terms of to improve the farming practices. But you realize that a lot of the farmers are really not understand, There's, there was a language barrier in one of the, in one of the areas. Uh, all, all in the in, in the chatbot essentially, and so you realize that you're providing a solution to an, a target group that does not really understand what um, that does not really understand. There's there's, there's a language barrier in, the, in essence, um, which means that probably the challenge. That, I mean, the solution there was really thought out, um, trying to provide farmers with advisories on farming practices, at least to caution against climate. But then you find that. Um, the barrier really, or the, one of the biggest challenges there was that the solution was not really addressing the end users. They were not designed with the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, with the farmer in mind or the, the end user in mind, because if you can't access, um, if, if you can't even access, if you can't essentially access in the language that you understand, you find then, then that's a huge challenge. And then lastly, I would also like to talk about um, using data for good or data for, for value creation. And this is something that at least we are doing as part of the Digital Transformation Center and more specifically on data economy in Kenya. We realize that for you to develop essentially generative AI solutions that are really tailored for the people that are human centered, then you have to also ensure, and then we also have to start with the base looking at the data. And part of what we are doing is trying to develop data use cases or solutions that are really geared towards economic value creation. And we have done this in various sectors. And one of the things that we, or one of the solutions that we have done is essentially trying to encourage um, um, this idea of data sharing, at least within the stakeholders, to ensure that at least th any solutions that are developed, whether it is from the startups or from the whole innovation ecosystem, then everyone has some form of basic training data that they can run their models in. And one of the ways that we have done that is we support the development of uh, the agricultural sector data gateway that is essentially supposed to be um, a data sharing application that is within um, Kenya that where users, various users, various private sector companies can access data, can access um, um, various data sets that would ideally not be available publicly. This also aligns then um, with the idea of par partnerships. And this is one of the ways that I think also development partners and also uh, and, and, and startups can really leverage on um, the idea of public-private partnerships. Because for if we realize at some point that, yes, we need to promote this idea of data sharing, at least to dev uh, develop products that are really geared towards um, uh, creating um, um, a product or use cases that solve the development challenge or that are geared towards food security as one of that, as, as an example. But you also realize that it's, it's, it's a challenge. Development partners don't have all the data. Private sector actors don't have 
you know, they also have access to some base of limited data. And there's also an issue of mistrust. So how do you ensure that all these partners are gathered together and how do you ensure that at least you create a cohesive um, um, environment where all these partners feel, um, you know, you create an element of trust for these partners to generate and even share data that can then be used to um, develop some of these um, um, AI applications. And then that's, that's now where our trust comes in and I think um, that has been mentioned before, trying to ensure that at least you leverage on the idea of partnerships. And this goes a long way. This has really worked for us because we realize that you can solve everything, whether you're in the private sector, whether you are this huge multinational company, whether you are, you know, whether it's even from the public sector side, at some point you will need innovators, at some point you will need engineers, at some point you will need the data and um, creating an environment that really fosters trust has really been super um, useful. I think I'll stop there because of time for now, but I'm happy to engage. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernard. And uh, moving on to Ms. Olga, how can equitable access to the benefits of generative AI, including data-driven insights and sustainable development, be ensured for all, including marginalized communities such as women, while safeguarding individual privacy and data protection rights? And also what strategies and regional or international initiatives can be employed to maximize the positive impact of generative AI and address potential digital divides and ethical considerations, for example, in Southeastern Europe? Uh, <coughs> thank you, Connie. Uh, so when I was uh, preparing for this session, I uh, was thinking, uh, since we are going to talk about uh, generative AI, let me also ask what generative AI is thinking about these topics uh, that uh, we will be talking about. So I asked Chad GPT what uh, he thinks, uh, how his design ensures equitable access uh, by uh, marginalized communities to the benefits uh, which uh, we expect uh, uh, to have from the generative uh, AI. And then the response uh, was that uh, this question uh, is uh, quite complex uh, and uh, multifaceted that it creates a lot of uh, challenges and uh, risks. And uh, then uh, ChatGPT went uh, with the whole list of those uh, issues uh, and principles uh, which have been already mentioned uh, by my co-panelists, uh, starting from uh, transparency and accountability, uh, the importance of uh, community engagement, uh, accessibility, uh, getting feedback, but also considering uh, uh, bias, which can be um, incorporated uh, in the data sets. Uh, uh, this is why I think uh, uh, what is important uh, to focus on when we are talking about uh, generative AI is uh, uh, the awareness and the literacy component uh, because uh, the technology as always is uh, already here. It is not the future. We always have to deal with the technology once it is already in place and once it is already widely used. And this is why it is uh, always uh, so complicated to catch up with those challenges and risks because they are already real time and we need to make sure that we can uh, prevent <coughs> prevent uh, them from aggravating as much uh, fast uh, as possible. And uh, Generative AI does not, exist, does not exist in vacuum, does not exist uh, uh, as separated from the human beings uh, because this is us who are using it and uh, that's us who can make uh, either good or bad out of it. So I believe uh, while it indeed can be very helpful uh, in, uh, in many cases, we should uh, also understand uh, that it's very important to, to teach and to educate uh, uh, people how to properly use generative AI and also to uh, give the understanding that whatever are the answers that uh, we are getting, whatever is the content that is generated uh, by uh, AI, this is uh, not always should be taken for granted as ultimate truth because it can uh, include also a lot of uh, biases, it can include a lot of false information. So what it requires is also analytical thinking and critical approach to analyzing the information that uh, we are getting uh, from uh, generative AI tools. and. Uh, it's, uh, it's not probably easy to do for everyone, especially if you don't have any kind of uh, uh, understanding of how to use those tools, because they are so easy that you just uh, drop the question, you get the answer, and you don't want to put extra effort into analyzing of what is that answer. But it is so often that uh, the answers look so good even that you don't want to question them. But then it appears that probably this is something which is, uh, which is so much also not true. Um, that's why uh, I would say uh, even uh, starting from the universities and the uh, high schools, uh, we should not uh, just uh, close eyes and let's say uh, be against the students using these tools. Uh, 
uh, but we should otherwise uh, help them to use these tools and to know how to use these tools. And uh, probably even that would be good to incorporate that uh, in the uh, general uh, school uh, university curricula. Just even uh, we could teach uh, students uh, those simple things like to find arguments maybe against those uh, co uh, answers which have been generated uh, by uh, AI or to see where can be biased there or to see whether those uh, 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 how much those are true and how much they correspond uh, to, to facts. So at least uh, after after this, uh, the we, sh we would be ready to use these tools in, uh, in some conscious manner. We would be ready to uh, analyze, to critically question what are those uh, results that are generated uh, by uh, AI tools. And um, this is also important uh, uh, in terms that uh, there is uh, this uh, statistics that uh, in the future around 80% uh, of uh, jobs uh, would be substituted by generative AI and, and there is also this argument uh, that uh, uh, we might no longer need uh, uh, to, to get higher education, let's say not, not everyone, especially when we talk about marginalized communities, uh, there is this uh, um, uh, belief that probably uh, generative AI could be very helpful for those who have been usually disadvantaged and could not get access to proper higher education. So with the help of generative AI, they, they could get the same good jobs. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, education would not be a preventive factor for them to get into the job market. And uh, this is where we should be uh, really careful uh, because, as I said, it's uh, it's not just about using the tool. This is about uh, uh, using the tool, but being conscious that it's not uh, the ultimate truth what it is uh, uh, providing. And uh, in this regard, there are also already uh, programs which are being uh, run uh, for reskilling and upskilling uh, um, the workforce. Uh, for example, uh, recently there has been uh, the. Uh, the application uh, period uh, for grants uh, by Microsoft and uh, data.org uh, for uh, exactly this topic, uh, how, the, how they can uh, uh, reskill and uh, upskill uh, the workforce uh, and uh, prepare uh, individuals to use the generative AI tools. And uh, I would say this is very important to focus on this, to include uh, all marginalized communities, uh, especially in, uh, in this process and uh, to make sure that uh, the collaboration exists uh, between uh, different uh, actors, between different stakeholders, and uh, that uh, there is uh, also um, joint uh, understanding of uh, those uh, risks uh, that uh, AI is bringing. But uh, let's say uh, if uh, we all unite efforts around this, and uh, if we start from awareness and education, then we can make sure that uh, we can prevent uh, those uh, large-scale risks. Otherwise, whatever we do, if we don't have proper understanding of uh, and proper uh, education around this, uh, then this can be just a very uh, targeted short-term approaches, but uh, that would not solve uh, uh, the core of the problem. Thank you, Ms. Olga, for your response. And now moving on to Ms. Valerie. Drawing from your experience in youth engagement in internet governance and advocacy for digital rights, how can young advocates actively shape policies that ensure the ethical development and accessibility of generative AI technologies for positive impacts, especially in areas like sustainable development? And also what role can youth, especially young girls, play in bridging the digital divide and promoting the benefits of generative AI to younger generations? Thank you so much, Connie, for that question. And um, I think what we see a lot of when it comes to youth engagement and youth involvement is the question of what are these systems? Again, so from my background, I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Kenya Youth Internet Governance Forum, and we had one question, what is AI? And the answer you'd get, AI is chat GPT. But is it really? I mean, it generative AI is just a subset of what AI includes in total. So from that question, we understood that most people do not even have the understanding of artificial intelligence and the subsystems it has and how that can operate. And I think this is very dangerous, especially from the part of the world I'm from, because I'm from Kenya, and we look at Africa generally as having the continent that has the most number of young people. So if young people are coming onto the internet without even the understanding of what artificial intelligence is, what generative Artificial, intelligent, arti artificial intelligence is, then we run the risk of not being able to even have a positive impact in terms of what AI can do. And I can tell you, um, being a tech lawyer, is that 
generative AI is already here with us. It's already operational. And we're already seeing um, big tech companies coming around talking about the principles and even launching and rolling out these systems. And these systems are actually good for young people because think about it. I like what Olga said about critical thinking because if you go to ChatGPT and say, please write this email in response to whatever email you want to respond to, it gives you a prompt. So you're able to see what you can respond, but you need to go the extra mile to understand that that the generative AI tool will not re replace your need to do some form of critical thinking in order to achieve the best practices that you have. So one thing that we normally see um, within the youth IGF circles is that you need to know about these systems because these systems are already here with us. We have ChatGPT, you, you have BARD, you have Bing. All these systems are already operational. It's up to us to understand and know these systems in order to use them for positive impact, but also responsibly. The second thing is to test out and pick out the flaws from the system. And you see what um, Olga had also said, um, she'd written this question to chat GPT and gotten an, a response. Are we also actively taking our time to test and pick out the flaws that these systems provide? Because some of the colleagues that we, we, we speak to and also that we support from a law firm perspective, always come to us and say, we are testing this out, we are picking out the flaws, but we can only test them and pick them out if the systems are being used and they're able to see the responses being generated. I'll give you an example. BARD is now available in Swahili. So in its initial steps, they had to test out in Swahili if it's going to give the same response it's giving in English. And funny enough, in English it would give a correct answer, whereas in Swahili it would give a completely um, different answer that they had to test out, they had to pick out the flaws from this system in order to make, to make them better. So how, again, as young people, are we using these systems to ensure that we get the correct or sort of like the most optimum response that we require? And again, the issue of improving access of, on generative AI, especially in different languages. Because we now recognize that generative AI is being used in education, it's being used in creativity, and again, a lot of the young people being deeply within the creator economy, there's a lot of um, use of these tools. H how are we improving access even in terms of localizing them in different languages? Because you'll come to find that a lot of the marginalized communities or a lot of the communities around the world do not necessarily just identify with speaking in English. And these are the tools that you're going to be using on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think for us, we are looking at that more actively. Again, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, during one of the sessions, the Office of the Data Protection in Kenya were launching an AI chatbot that will be able to assist people to understand better the Data Protection Act in Kenya. And the question is, do people even understand that this service is going to be available? How to access this service? Again, back to what Bernard was talking about when it comes to access. Again, back to what um, Professor was talking about when it comes to AI regulation. So those are some of the things that we need to be testing out in terms of youth engagement, even in our local communities, to understand where the young people stand. And again, now back to the whole uh, creator economy and the creator generation, we're getting more and more issues around how generative AI is impacting copyright. It's impacting intellectual property infringement. So these are things we need to think about more. And I liked um, what I said earlier about putting in the safeguards and putting in the um, safety rails to ensure that the issue of privacy is dealt with, also to ensure that we have some form of content filtering. I like the idea of the digital watermark. Are we able to know what is, um, what is AI generated versus what is not? I think now m what we are seeing more in terms of international law firms and law firms in general, they are moving towards even having their engagement letters say that will the does the client permit for their information to be sort of like their advice to also have AI components in it. And I think this is one of the things that we need to understand as we continue to um, continue to understand how to use these generative AI tools. So I think even for young people, the issue of self-education, the issue of understanding and advocating for ethical guidelines by the uh, developers of these tools, the issue of joining organizations that are actively um, creating resources around generative AI, actively creating advocacy for this. Um, I'll give you an example as well. Where we do our work in Kenya, there are many ICT organizations that usually come together when it comes to policy development, and even when it comes to policy critique, uh, when it comes to public participation, when it comes to legislative development, 
are there similar um, approaches that can be used across the world to ensure that now more than ever, we're going to be needing the multi-stakeholder model. Because the truth is that the generative AI tools are being developed more in, in, in a speedy way by big tech companies. So what we have in Kenya that works very well is that we are seeing more big tech companies being heavily involved in policy development. So they're coming in to say that this is the uh, tool that we are creating, this is how it works. How then can you discuss with the civil society, with the private sector, with the technical community, and with governments to ensure that you're creating a harmonized form of soft law, like you said, because again, technology is so fast-paced in a way that creating the hard laws that are developed into acts are not fast enough to catch up with what, what and where technology is taking us. So I think these are some of the things that we're looking at as young people, Connie. Thank you. If I can just uh, make one point, I think the the issue that you raised about languages is such an important one, and I think that that's that's something that that we we struggle with as well, and we want to focus on. I come from India, for example, which has twenty two official languages and a number of dialects. And you know, when we're thinking about when we're thinking about providing resources and transparency in education, it's not it's obviously not enough to do it in English. It's really in, important to have it in in the different languages, not just not just I mean India is an example, but the rest of the world. And we find that working with local partners, that's why it's so important. And you know, just in terms of making sure that we're inclusive and we're diverse and creating those resources in the education material and the transparency in the language itself, because languages are so nuanced as well. Something that I say in English, if you translate it into a different language, it just, to your point, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work or it doesn't resonate. And those kind of cultural, uh, cultural norms, I think are really important, important as well. So I, 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 I think that's a really, really important point. Thank you, Ms. Valerie and Mr. Pali. And now we move on to addressing ethical dilemmas and challenges in a generative AI use and commercialization. So first, Ms. Olga, how can lessons from internet governance practices be applied to balance freedom of speech and prevent deepfake related harm within the framework of generative AI use and commercialization? And also what role should global and regional organizations play in establishing a regulatory framework respecting intellectual property rights while preventing the misuse of AI technologies? Over to you. So I think what we can take from uh, internet governance practices is first of all this uh, collaborative approach towards finding uh, um, solutions uh, in uh, when it is related to technology and in this case uh, to generative AI. So uh, there has to be a lot of uh, uh, communication uh, between uh, those companies uh, that are developing generative AI, but also uh, government uh, governments around the world uh, who are essentially trying to uh, regulate for better or for worse uh, uh, this uh, new technology. And uh, also with the uh, civil society, especially with the uh, inclusion of uh, marginalized uh, groups, because uh, they are usually uh, the ones uh, who uh, might not be able to properly uh, and fully use uh, the benefits of uh, this technology if uh, they are not also included uh, in uh, the process. Uh, so let's say this uh, whole uh, IGF uh, this year is a lot about uh, AI in its different uh, shapes and forms, but it would be very good if after all these discussions, uh, the key points which uh, have been made uh, would be taken uh, further and uh, uh, transformed into some specific uh, action points. And uh, because there are so many, uh, essentially here in this uh, uh, space, there are so many uh, people who are either part of those uh, creators of uh, generative AI or those uh, who are on the regulatory side, but also so many of uh, bright minds from civil society. So this is exactly uh, the space where these people can uh, connect and uh, further uh, get engaged into some specific uh, projects and uh, initiatives and then work together on making uh, the usage of uh, AI uh, ethical uh, and uh, accountable and uh, transparent. Uh, and uh, also it is important uh, to uh, pay attention uh, that uh, there is always in place uh, some uh, oversight uh, mechanism uh, to make sure also that uh, uh, the users have the opportunity uh, to report uh, harmful content. Uh, but also, as I said, that uh, there are in place uh, awareness raising and educational programs. Uh, because if you have no idea how what is deep fake, if you even have never heard about uh, this uh, uh, concept, uh, you would uh, never even uh, think uh, that uh, what you are watching uh, might be uh, essentially a deep fake but uh, but not a, a real time uh, uh, video uh, so this uh, this is very important uh, to connect all these components and to connect all these stakeholders and uh, uh, 
while these still uh, this all policies and regulations they are still uh, in the making we can uh, we still have a chance uh, to shape them in a proper way and uh, to consider uh, that knowledge and the skills which have been accumulated uh, to date so that uh, uh, we don't put uh, in place uh, the legal frameworks uh, which uh, would uh, either be not enough because uh, they just uh, provide some general principles or would be uh, or would be on the other side over regulating the technology and uh, in this way preventing uh, preventing the innovation but on the other side uh, we already have uh, uh, a lot of legal norms which are regulating uh, uh, the harmful content the legal content and uh, this same can also apply to as much as it is uh, relevant uh, to generative AI, but we just need to, to make sense and uh, to make sure that everyone who is involved in these discussions uh, essentially understands what is uh, generative AI, uh, what it brings, what uh, are its benefits and uh, what is its negative impact as well. Thank you, Ms. Olga, for your response, and also thank you for joining the panel today. Yes, and I also want to apologize because I need to leave for another meeting, but uh, it was really a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Thank you. And so now we move on to Mr. Hiroki. So generative AI use holds significant opportunities and impacts on the economy, society, and cybersecurity. So how can international collaboration promote positive outcomes from generative AI and formulate policies and regulations addressing intellectual property rights, liability, data sovereignty, and responsible data use while maintaining public trust and information integrity in the age of generative AI? Thank you, Connie. Um, you know, we do, we've discussed a lot of different perspectives, uh, I mean, different topics about generative AI, but all discussions went to the same direction, which is the necessity of multi-stakeholder policy making and multi-stakeholder dialogue to for, for the better use of generative AI. Um, and I also strongly support the position. Uh, and the reason why I uh, strongly believe in the multi-stakeholder approach is that uh, according to my experience in the government officer, um, there is always a um, limitation of access accessibility uh, to this technology or understanding of technology from the government side. And I'm not blaming uh, the, the lack of literacy of the government, it's not, but it's just because all systems are so different and, uh, and things move so quickly, so I mean, nobody can uh, specifically understand what this technology is or how this algorithm works. Uh, so we always need some input uh, uh, from the stakeholders who actually developed uh, or designed the systems. So that's one of the, one of the reasons why we need the multi-stakeholder collaboration. And also there are always the ethical questions, I mean, I mean Ethical questions, we have faced a lot of ethical questions even before the AI, of course. But AI brought a lot of um, new opportunities. Uh, for example, you know, uh, you can now use AI for the cameras on the street to detect people precisely and uh, even trace uh, where this person is going and what did he do, uh, if you want. Uh, but so this kind of activity was not possible before AI. I mean, of course, the police could watch the video camera, but it takes a lot of human resources, but without any human resources, AI could do that. But is that ethical? Or to what extent uh, you should balance the privacy risks and public risks by you know, terrorists or other you know, criminals? So these questions are uh, not be, uh, cannot be solved by a single stakeholder, such as the government. Uh, we really uh, need to uh, implement the democracy into those technologies. And in this context, democracy doesn't mean, you know, that you select the, the parliament members and the parliament members decide the rules and just the government implement it. It's not that. I mean, uh, for each technology, we need more democratic processes. And I hear the matter uh, implemented a, uh, or did an experiment about the democratic decision making on your generative AI. Um, uh, and, and content moderation or like so. So I, I think it's a great initiative. So anyway, so we uh, believe that multi-stakeholder process is a, a necessary and Japan, uh, 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 I mean Japanese government uh, uh, launched the concept of so-called agile governance, which is 
not only multi-stakeholder, but also uh, agile and distributed uh, process of governance. So agile means iterative processes. So, okay, now you can uh, decide your rules, but nobody can assure that this rule works correctly. Um, and before the technology didn't move that fast, uh, we could just make uh, rules and we could just keep the rules for like, 10 years or 20 years. But now, even one year after the rule was established, already this rule could be uh, obsolete. So we always need to try to update the rules, uh, but then uh, you know our legislative process cannot move that fast. Uh, at least in Japan, uh, it's impossible to make a new regulation, I mean new law, uh, more than every two years. So it takes a lot of time. So that's why we believe that the regulation should be more principle-based or goal-based, outcome-based, rather than uh, rule-based. And then, uh, the uh, we, should, we still need uh, some uh, actual um, uh, practices or guidelines, guidances uh, to translate these principles into actual operations. And that part could be managed or handled by uh, you know, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, organizations or even private companies or NGOs. Uh, and, and that could be updated in a flexible manner. So this is what is called uh, agile governance in Japan and a lot of other governments or other uh, international organizations also uh, are thinking about the similar concept. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, th this iterative process is really, really uh, difficult to, um, to implement in the international stage. Again, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to make an international consensus, at least uh, in the intergovernmental level. So um, uh, first, we have to recognize that this cannot be done by the government only. So, uh, and we should appreciate the private initiatives like big tech companies or, uh, or startups. Uh, and, and also talk about, you know, uh, what technology could be used for what purposes. Uh, again, uh, it's, um, uh, we really need uh, the close communication with tech companies and civil society to uh, make all principles and ethical uh, uh, values uh, 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 operational. So this is my comment. Thank you, Mr. Hiroki, for the comments. And now moving on to Ms. Pali. How does Meta perceive the economic, societal, and cybersecurity implications of generative AI commercialization, including accessibility, affordability, intellectual property, and the challenges of ba balancing content moderation with freedom of expression? And also additionally, what policies, regulations, and technological approaches is Meta advocating or exploring to ensure responsible data use, data sovereignty, cybersecurity, and prevent malicious uses, especially in the context of deepfakes and generative AI. Thanks, Connie. I'll, I'll answer the question in uh, two parts. I think the first is that I did talk about our community standards, which uh, you know, which are available publicly, which make it clear what is okay and not okay to share on our platforms. And we have community standards governing a wide variety of, of what you call bad content. So you know, we don't allow bullying and harassment or hate speech or child sexual abuse material. Uh, and many other categories of content. We don't dif differentiate between organic content or generative uh, AI content. And I think that's that's an important point to make. And so if even if it's generative um, AI, if it violates our policies, we'll still take action as per our community standards, which, which is what we'll remove that content. And I think that that's, that's what we do with the generative AI content. The second thing is, if content is being generated in the products that a company is, is developing, so for example, uh, you know, a chat model or any other kind of generative product. And then we go back to uh, you know, the earlier things that, that I've talked about that, that we've already started working on because we do ha have um, rolled out a limited set of um, products in the, in the US which use generative AI technology. One is extensive red teaming. We work with internal and external partners, uh, many of them experts in their whole own field, uh, to make sure that we're stress testing 
uh, the service before we launch it. I mean, I think that's really important. The second is is uh, fine tuning, and as I've as I've given some examples, it's really important that we fine tune it so that the output is controlled and safe in many ways, and also as an opportunity, really, to uh, to provide resources or or, or connect people, particularly young adults who are actually looking for resources or seeking help, and that's something that you know that we should look at. As a, as a potential. The third is that incorporate a feedback loop into the particular product, and we want to do this because when uh, you know when when the product is generating a response, make sure that you know you're giving a user the opportunity to give feedback. Like, was that helpful? Was that spammy? Was that something that was you know uh, that was something that was not not useful at all? And incorporate uh, that feedback into into uh, our products. So I think that these are a, a couple of things that, that we think about when we're either thinking about generative AI content generally or we're thinking about generative AI um, AI products. The the other point on, on international international cooperation is that you know Meta has also founded uh, um, an organization called Partnership for Open AI, which is not just industry, but it's um, NGOs and it's academics. And I think it's so important for experts to come together. And we've had many consultations with the experts before. We've, you know, we've thought about launching um, generative AI products. And even as we think about principles that we incorporate into our work, and one particular set of recommendations that this organization has issued is actually on synthetic media because it's so important um, not just for one company but but for the industry as a whole uh, to have or to adopt some kind of principles-based approach when dealing with synthetic media. And they have recommendations and practices uh, for three categories. So if you're... Uh, a creator of generative AI, you know, there are certain practices that you should follow if you're a distributor, for example, or if you're somebody who's building or using that technology. And some of the things that, that it recommends is, again, we've talked about having a provenance, making sure that you're watermarking, providing transparency, providing education. And these are some of the things that, you know, that we're, that we're collectively working on to ensure that that we address the issue of, of deep, uh, uh, deep fakes and other misuse of, of generative AI uh, technology. The other thing is that, you know, uh, in addition to our community standards, we also have a manipulated media policy. And I think that's, that's important to call out as well because sometimes uh, the content generative may not be hate speech, it may not be abusive material, but it may just be patently false and, and um, be something that is very easily believable to be false. And therefore, we have this manipulated uh, media policy to make sure that even that kind of content goes against our community standards and we're able to able to report it. The, the issue of freedom of speech, I think, is interesting because in, in this policy, we make an exemption for parody and satire. And uh, that's really important as well because uh, I think we need to respect um, um, respect freedom of speech. and. Uh, also, some of the most uh, interesting content that is generated is is parody and it's satire and it's an important form of expression. So these are the things that we think about and we just don't think about uh, uh, these in in isolation. We we do consultations with experts, whether they're safety experts or civil rights organizations, or um, you know government stakeholders in terms of how we think about how we think about these things, how we think about. Uh, uh, you know, uh, keep keeping people safe on our platforms. How we think about educating, and one of the things that we also also do is that to the point that um, um, you know that that some of the co-panelists made that it's really important to know that you're interacting with with a generative AI product, and uh, when someone engages with uh, uh, with a, a generative AI chat, for example, we provide um, education the first time, saying that, hey, this is what it is. These are the limitations, and this is where you can learn more. And I think that's really important as well as you're interacting with, as more of us are interacting with these products, to have that those points of education and awareness. And you know, while we've only seen we've we've only seen very early days of how these services are used, I think that you know keeping an open feedback loop, whether it's in the form of in-product or whether it's in f the form of continuing to consult 
uh, with the, with stakeholders i think it's it's really an important process in how we're going to develop uh, approaches and mitigations to um, to generative ai thank you very much mr pali for your insights and now moving on to mr bernard how can interdisciplinary approaches research and collaborations contribute to improving the prevention detection verification and moderation of generative ai content ensuring responsible use and safeguarding information integrity and public trust especially in regions like east africa with a focus on accessibility affordability intellectual property rights and data sovereignty over to you thank you connie i think i'll um, just summarize my findings into three um, key um, solutions that I think would be, you know, um, that I would I think would be applicable in this case. And I think one I'll start with what uh, Professor already mentioned here earlier on about collaboration. And I'm just going to, because he gave a very interesting example in transport. I don't know if <laughs> uh, we didn't talk earlier because I had a very interesting similar example that was given earlier in terms of how collaboration really helps to facilitate um, uh, uh, and, and really helps to facilitate um, um, generating of positive or generating of uh, um, generating of positive um, impacts or in the realization of positive impacts of gener um, uh, generative AI. And here we look at our example in startups development. If you look at, you know, if you look at transport as an example, you look at um, the role in terms of who does what. An example is, if you look at, for instance, the infrastructure itself, for instance, the public sector, the government in this case is responsible for developing, whether it's the airport, whether it's the roads, or whether it's, you know, in the form of infrastructure, right? And then two, you look at the role, what is the role of private sector in this case? The role of private sector is to, um, one, develop innovations or develop whether it's um, cars or whether it's to develop planes or whatever role, um, um, whatever sort of um, product that will utilize the existing infrastructure. And using that example alone, if you try to interchange um, this without the oversight of the other, because you will have, you know, um, the public sector, you will have the government trying to construct, you know, roads or infrastructure that does not actually meet the needs of the, um, of the, of the, um, of the private sector or the needs of the innovations that are, you know, created every day. And if you try to exchange us on the other end, you find that, you know, without consultation, you find that, you know, the government or the public sector, from the public sector perspective, is trying to create um, infrastructure that does not actually meet the needs all, uh, of, um, of what is actually being invented. And that is actually the same case in regulating and in terms of how we should approach generative AI because it's not just, it's not a one shoe fits all. It's not, no, no one sector um, or no one actor has really the solutions that um, that can provide a comprehensive or, or an ethical guideline. It's, it's more of a multidisciplinary or more of a multi-stakeholder approach in this case. And then two, something that we're also looking at is this idea of localized um, research and trying to um, one, understand the context and the, and, and the regional specific cultural nuances. And one of th why that is important is it's, it's also dependent on the fact that we are seeing very little or they are essentially looking at it from the positive side. We are trying to see if we can promote the development of more research and more um, innovative, in innovative and incubation hubs that really are geared towards creating solutions that really solve um, um, that solve the, the, the challenges of the of the regional specific actors. And an example is that we're seeing a lot of, if you compare the number of uh, research and the number of um, really, f you know, farms that are really doing practical R&D work that are developing solutions, it's, you know, the, the, the you know, the differences in terms of funding around it's, 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 it's quite shocking actually. So the question then becomes in terms of how can you then promote this idea of having to see or, or increasing essentially the funding towards, um, you know, having one, the capacity towards um, having even more, um, you know, um, engineers, like, for, you know, it's, it's, it's super interesting, like, 
one of the challenges that we seldom have, um, or sel I seldom receive from one of the partners that I talk to, is that they have a very interesting idea, but they don't have an engineer or a data scientist who can maybe support um, in terms of fine tuning a model that is, you know, that really would work for the people or that would really um, speak to the data that is at hand. And we're seeing this over and over again in terms of that gap, even in terms of funding, um, especially in, I would say, in, 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 in sub Saharan Africa, for example. And then three, this is now. I think also Dipali mentioned about this in terms of public awareness and transparency. And here you're looking at it from both a positive and from both um, the negative aspect, right? I'll give you an example of last week, um, I think the last two weeks, if you have been watching, um, if you are interested in the, uh, you know, in the launches that have been happening in terms of the phone industry, I realized there's one feature that was introduced by one of the companies. Um, it's called best take photography. Best take photography is a feature whereby you look at, you take a picture. Um, so d from the picture that um, you take, it's a new feature. Uh, from the picture that you take, essentially the, um, the AI generates uh, you know, multiple images or it takes multiple pictures and then tries to render that into one. And then even before that, it gives you an option if you know, if you're, for, for instance, frowning, or if, you know, if you're looking down, you know, it gives you an, ex an option of having to, you know, change um, some features of your face and trying to make it seem more lively, right? You know, from a positive p perspective, you know, everyone likes a good picture. But then, you know, you look at it at a second turn, or you look at a second take into it, and you're like, wait, this is actually a fake. It, the, the picture does not, you know, it's another element of reality that, does not really depict what really happened here because it's not, um, you know, certain elements of the image have been sort of tweaked or certain elements of reality have been, um, um, that have been sort of amended or, or, or edited in real time. And so you ask, you know, and, and, and now just that, that's just one of the examples, but you know, looking ahead and looking into the future and you're, wonder, and you're wondering, Will we get to a point whereby we are seeing, in terms of um, realities, or you're, you're making decisions based on realities, whether it's on text or imagery, and you don't know whether this is essentially um, image generated or it's essentially, you know, you, do, you don't know the differences between whether it's real or not. And this is an example in terms of how transparency can really assist, because in that example of photography that I gave in, um, you know, of course, the idea is to look at the positive. That's what the company was really focusing on. But then what about the also the, the negative implications of it? Who is also looking at what this potential, you know, where what what is um, um, the negative potential of this, which is, you know, it's an, an edited image of reality that seems to perceive, you know, what is real. You know, um, we don't have a lot of awareness raising sessions to talk about this. So you know, I didn't, at least I didn't see uh, um, uh, that element being mentioned. So that's, 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 that's what I had. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. And now moving on to Ms. Valerie, as a tech policy analyst with experience in legal frameworks and international internet governance forums, how can legal and regulatory measures effectively address the ethical dilemmas and challenges related to generative AI commercialization, including disinformation, intellectual property rights, liability, and cross-border enforcement? And also, how can youth voices be integrated into discussions and solutions for generative AI regulations? Thank you so much, Courtney. So when you talk about legal framework, can you hear me? Oh, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, um, so when you're talking about uh, legal frameworks and how that can help in terms of uh, the use of generative AI, disinformation, intellectual property infringement, first we'll have to look at it from the beginning. So most countries you find do not have a specific law on artificial intelligence. Like Professor said earlier, what we have is soft law, we have guidelines, we have policies, which obviously um, connect to the entire ecosystem of the legal frameworks, but we don't have anything specific to do with artificial intelligence. I'll give you one, for one in my country, Kenya, we were actually doing a study as to when we had all this artificial intelligence 
um, tools coming into the market, the question was, how is it going to be regulated? How is it going to be enforced? Who is going to take up liability? How is it going to be used? Because this was a big question. And I think a lot of the reports uh, that are now going globally have seen what's happening in Kenya in terms of how forward the country has been when it comes to regulation and promotion of technology in the, in the continent at large. So the first thing was we have um, a form of guideline that could guide artificial intelligence when it comes to the financial sector. Again, like Professor said, it's very sector specific and we don't have an overarching law in terms of artificial intelligence. So what the government has done is that they have gone ahead to form a task force, more like a working group that will enable them to revise all the legislative frameworks we've had over the years when it comes to ICT. And what that will do, it enables us as a country to look forward into the future and say these are the technologies we are dealing with now and they're not in line with the legislative frameworks that we've had over the years. And what I like about that task force is that they have captured, successfully captured actually, each and every stakeholder group that we have within the Internet Governance Forum ecosystem. You have academia there, you have um, private sector, you have technical community, you have government, you have um, the civil society, because you constantly require that oversight and that accountability framework to ensure that the laws that you're coming up with are conducive for one, innovation, but also regulate to ensure that there are safeguards for the people that you're going to present these products to. The other thing is that what I've found that's very helpful when it comes to legislative frameworks as well is that have the developers come onto the table. Because another challenge I'll tell you we face even from a uh, legal perspective in terms of working in the private sector in a law firm is that we get um, clients coming in and saying, this is what, what we are being asked to do. We are being asked to pull down this content. We are being asked to regulate this content in this way, but we can't. Because from a developer perspective, I'll give an example of encryption. If you tell someone to break encryption today, you can't break encryption for one entry. You're, breaking, you're essentially breaking encryption to all. So anyone can then enter that system. And I think what happens with legislators is that if you do not have that understanding from a developer's perspective that this can't work and you put in a law that says let's break it, then you essentially don't understand how the tools are working on the ground versus the legal frameworks that you're coming up with. So I think that whole multi-stakeholder model of the approach has really helped to better understand. Again, now from my background as an intellectual property um, lawyer, is that what we found with generative AI, a lot of the complaints have been around copyright. I'm sure you've all heard about what's happening with the, with the authors when it comes to them complaining and even filing suits saying that their work is being used within this generative AI product. And I think one of the things that's very important is to also have an understanding of what safeguards can be put in place, even down to content filtering to ensure that you then do not propagate an issue of copyright infringement. Because you are trying to promote innovation, but also still trying to safeguard um, authors and what their intellectual property are. So I think that's also a very important process. And I think I really liked what Pali said, had, had said earlier about the open feedback loop. These tools are very, are in their nascent stages. They're just coming into the market. So we are at the point of we are trying, we are testing, to then develop something better over time. And for me, I've always been very pro-innovation. So it has always been generative AI is here encouraging everyone to take part so that we have a situation where we are creating tools that are giving us a better future, a more innovative future, and a more empowered sort of workforce or a more empowered society going forward. Again, with the issue of ethical principles, there's always the problems that come with privacy, data protection, confidentiality, how much of your personal information can you then feed into these tools? How much of um, privacy should you be keeping in mind to ensure that you don't have a situation where all the information that is going there is then attacking the privacy principles that we have currently and that we are constantly trying to develop. So that's something we need to look at um, more broadly as well. Also, when it comes to legislative frameworks and the issue of um, enforcement is that artificial intelligence cannot then survive in a vacuum. A lot of what we do now is very cross-border. You're working across countries. Do our legal systems and the legislative frameworks and the people in these um, different authorities also have an understanding of how 
cross-border cooperation can be done or enforcement can be done. I'll give you another example. Sometimes um, you're working with government and they would want you to give certain information. This information cannot be given whether the, where there's no, what you're calling a mutual legal assistant treaty. So do our legislators look also onto the side of, we then need to be in spaces where we are saying, can our countries collaborate to ensure responsible use of artificial intelligence? And can they collaborate by coming onto the table, having an understanding of how these tools work, having an understanding of how governments can then communicate with each other to build a better legislative framework? I think if we don't have all these ducks in a row, then this is the place that we need to start to start developing so that to make to ensure that we have a robust legal framework that yes does promote innovation but also ensures that there are safeguards to protect the people that the innovation is meant to serve and not have a situation where it's the other way around where then regulation will be used to stifle development because that's not what we are looking for we are promoting innovation but with proper safeguards and proper um proper safety principles when it comes to privacy, data protection. And one reason I'm usually very um, excited to be in this kind of forums is because we are able to exchange best practices. You read a lot about what's happening in the artificial intelligence space, a lot about what's happening in, in data protection, privacy, intellectual property infringement, and you're able to borrow best practices from different countries to also allow you then influence policy and influence legislation in our own countries. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valerie, for the response. And thank you once again to the panel for their insightful and in-depth responses to the questions. And now that you have all heard what the panel has to say, please feel free to raise your questions. There has been a question from the chat which says, how can government or international community will continue to support the young people to continue to improve the development and learning of the generative AI technology education using different languages across their local communities so that young people will have more access to the knowledge of generative AI? Would any of the speakers like to take up this question? I, I can start, but I'd, I'd love to hear the other panelists as well. I think that one of the things at least we uh, we think about and we've, we've started doing a lot more of is uh, consultations at the stage of creating a, a particular product. So I'll give you an example. Uh, for Facebook Messenger and Instagram, we've launched parental supervision tools. And for those parental to supervision tools, we actually had, in, in more than 10 countries, we had consultations, not just with parents, but with parents and young teens and experts, often in the same room. And I think that that was something that was really useful and hel helped us develop uh, these tools because, it, you know, sometimes when, when you're developing, uh, developing tools and services, for uh, for young people particularly, you often don't have them in the room and you're listening to parents and you're listening to experts, but young people have a voice and they have rights and they definitely deserve to be part of the process. And I think that that's something really important. And when we're thinking about, and I know that some governments are doing this as well as con you know consulting young people. And I think that that's really important if when we're thinking about multilateral processes or multilateral engagements, how can we, consistently engage young people into those processes as a really important stakeholder group is is uh, is the, i guess the uh, the response that i would i would give but i'm curious to hear the other other panelists if they have any comments yeah um, i totally agree with that um, young people are just so creative, so sometimes they use the tools much better than the adults do. So um, uh, we shouldn't say that you know you cannot use the generative AI for your you know study or education. Or, uh, so the instead uh, the what 
we have to think about is how to you know just check uh, whether there is any bad conduct is happening or you know uh, uh, the some students or you know uh, mentally uh, get sick because of generative AI. I mean, I I don't know how it happens, but it could happen. So uh, always, you know, uh, checking what is happening in the uh, in the study field I is uh, uh, important, but you know, prohibiting generative AI, use of generative AI is not the uh, answer, I think. Sorry, yes. I also think the question is what can government do, but also I feel like government cannot work in a silo, but other approaches that the government could take is that especially getting into the school systems and getting it within the curriculums or within sort of like career days or academic days, um, if so, if you have them, or something similar, if you have them in your countries as well, to ensure that there's just an understanding of what artificial intelligence is, of what generative AI is. And also, I really like that we have these short courses that normally come up online these days. So some of these developers also come up with this, um, developers and companies rather, also come up with these short courses online that can also help to guide and make people understand what these generative AI tools do and how they work. So the government could go the formal schooling route, whereas other players within the private sector, within the civil society as well, could also take up trainings as well, just the same way you'd have an internet governance course that trains you on what internet governance is, then also similar trainings that talk um, specifically as to what generative AI is, its potentials, its, its risks, and what to look out for when using these tools. I also think it's very important to ensure that young people are aware of these tools and how to use them effectively. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll add slightly to what I think, Barry, you have already started on in terms of what government can do. You've talked about awareness also, but also like to give the example of, you know, in terms of regulation. I was reading up the other day and I realized that Tunisia have this interesting regulation on the Startups Act. And the idea from the Startups Act is to pull more, fun, more uh, creatives, more young people, uh, more innovators into the AI space and not, not really specifically into AI, but more into the startup space that allows them to develop um, um, companies, allow them to develop their products. Um, and then from the public sector perspective, the government, you know, sort of provides some sort of a cushion just in case, just um, 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 uh, through some form of funding as an example. And I found that to be super interesting because now you're allowing creatives to you know, um, ideate and develop positive or uh, generative AI tools that are geared towards, you know, solving the most um, and tackling, to tackling the most challenging um, um, challenges in our societies. But on the, b on, on the other end, you know, the government has sort of set this question for you and trying, you know, allowing you essentially to innovate and, 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 and be your best self while cautioning you financially in some way. Um, I, I found that to be really interesting, and I, I, I think that, that that is something that I think more governments, or at least our government, should do um, to provide more resources for young people, for them to innovate, because they have the ideas, they have the potential, and they have the opportunity to do good. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for their responses to the question. We have around four minutes left, so if there are any on-site participants who would like to raise a question, please do so now. Hi, I'm Vineet from Cyberpeace, and I have a question regarding uh, AI-based misinformation, disinformation that is being spread and uh, targeting elections also at times and politicians and even the society at large. So what strategy should the nation and even how can civil society, industry, academia contribute so that a large scale awareness can be spread and how do we counter these kind of emerging challenges where sometimes it even leads to loss of life. So uh, any suggestions on that from the panel, please? Would any of the speakers like to take the question? I think generally in, in, in terms of uh, misinformation and disinformation, I think a couple of things that we talked about, that I talked about in, in dealing with generative AI products, I think from incorporating 
um, safety by design, stress testing, uh, you know, stress testing the products, uh, red teaming, fine tuning, etc., and all of that. All of that is is something that I that I that that we do. But just in terms of when we're not thinking of generative AI, I think one of the things that that has been partially successful is working with fact checking organizations to debunk to debunk misinformation and disinformation. And um, I don't know if you know, but in a lot of social media companies, you get those fact check responses, which actually I sometimes find helpful. And I know that companies have started using it for generative uh, the AI as well. Hey, this has been generated by AI, or this is you know this is false and it has been debunked by a particular fact checker. I think those kind of partnerships again are really important, particularly during the during the election election period. And I think also working. Uh, also working to create uh, education and awareness in terms of how content can be reported um, for violation of community standards, whether it's you know whether it's organic content or generative AI content. I think other 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 two things that I would I would mention. Are there any other speakers who would like to add on? I think I can also just slightly touch on this. I was reading up the other day and I realized that there's a whole element that is known as black box AI. And this is whereby you find that um, some generative AI um, algorithms get to, can't really explain in terms of how they go to making a certain decision. And so if you, if, if, if the generative AI can't explain in terms of how it, re how it achieves towards giving you an opinion in how it achieves towards generating a certain image or text, and then on one hand, you have uh, perhaps somebody else who is really dependent on making critical decisions. Um, then perhaps they might also be in a position whereby they are spreading, you know, misinformation and disinformation, you know, based on their objectives or based on what they received from, uh, based on the responses that they received. So I think one of the possible solutions is just being transparent, like, um, um, which means that um, content providers and now we're looking also at companies need to be really transparent in terms of explaining in terms of how these um, um, uh, decisions are really made in terms of how the model is really making the decision and if they can't really explain it then also you know be transparent about it because as you've mentioned a lot of um, stakeholders are dependent on making that are dependent on um, uh, making decisions out of that so I, I think I think that's, that's how I would also look at it. Thank you to the speakers for their Sorry. responses and Sorry. our workshop. <laughs> no, just to agree with the department, just to give a bit of context. I remember when we had um, the situation, there was the NSAR situation in Nigeria at the time. There were a lot, just like the Pali said, there were a lot of, um, when you would log on to X to see what's happening in the country, there was a lot of that fact-checking information that says, please note that this information is false, it's been verified this way, that way. So I think even moving towards, especially as uh, a period of elections where things are extremely sensitive, the same way we sensitize people to uh, make sure they're registered to vote, in that same breath, there should be sensitization around how to look out for what information is factual and what is false. And that starts all the way from the poll registering for the elections to the poll conducting the ele elections as well. Just that there's a verified channel of source of information, but also fact checkers to ensure that the information coming out, we're able to tell whether it's false or it's true. Again, now this ties with um, the campaign that Access Now has driven around keeping it on, because I think if, the in if we have issues such as internet shutdowns, then we're not able to verify that the information being spread is false or true, or we are not even able to get the information to begin with. So I think getting a lot of resources around fact checkers, but also getting a lot of resources to be pulled into the process of ele elections from start to stop. So you're able to put resources not only in voter registration, but also in voter education when it comes to fact checking, and also just understanding the world we are living in now where there's possibilities of disinformation and misinformation, and looking at it from a very human-centered approach, where you're looking at the human being to be critical of the information they're receiving and critical of the information they're spreading as well. Thank you.
Uh, just for information, uh, Japan also has a technology which is called uh, originator profile where uh, publishers can watermark their name on the article so that you know people can just confirm that this article was uh, actually published by or written by this person or this organization. Thank you very much to the speakers and our workshop has ended today. Thank you for your participation and commitment to these discussions and thank you for coming. <laughs>